Hi, everyone. My name is Amir Yazdan Bakhsh, and I'm a research scientist at Google Research. Today, I'm going to talk about machine learning for computer architecture. A little bit about myself. I did my PhD at Georgia Tech under the supervision of Professor Hadi Ismailzadeh, uh, where I worked on uh, approximate computing solutions for um, general purpose computing and designing accelerator for machine learning. I did multiple internships in NVIDIA, Microsoft Research, and uh, after graduation, I joined Google as an AR resident. Following the residency year, uh, I joined Google Research as a full-time and as a research scientist. Um, uh, I started working on uh, ML for system problems, and then I started uh, the initiative of how we can use machine learning to design better uh, computer architecture and better accelerators. So let's start about uh, the history. Um, as I mentioned in my PhD, I worked a lot on designing accelerator for machine learning. And I think many of us know uh, that uh, there are a lot of uh, hardwares and accelerators for machine learning. Some of the examples are Google TPUs, uh, GraphCore, Cerebras, NVIDIA GPUs, and so on and so forth. But today, we want to talk why do we need machine learning for computer architecture? So there are multiple reasons that I have highlighted here. Um, first, the set of domains and applications for machine learning is growing rapidly. So we have vision uh, solutions, we have uh, natural language processing, autonomous vehicles, and so on and so forth. Not only that, but also the requirements from end users are different. We may need to provide solutions for IoT devices, or we may need to provide solutions for desktop uh, computers or servers. There are some uh, set of solutions like uh, HTTP, as I mentioned, uh, uh, TPUs and uh, graph cores, Cerebras, uh, but that, that does not um, answer the growing um, uh, uh, set of applications and user requirements. So for that, we started a team, an initiative at Google Research to basically redefine the computing stack and discover an intuitive and more efficient architectures for domain-specific accelerators using machine learning, uh, uh, using machine learning and machine learning advances and data-driven uh, approaches. So today uh, I'm going to talk about two of the projects uh, that uh, I am uh, working on, and um, uh, let me tell you a little bit about them. Um, so one reason, one of the uh, kind of uh, uh, requirements for uh, designing better accelerators and better hardware is to kind of um, tune the microarchitecture parameters, such as memory sizes, number of compute units, and so on and so forth. One of the challenges in this space is that um, basically the space of accelerators and uh, machine learning is high dimensional, it's growing. And not only that, uh, but also there are many solutions in this space that are not feasible. They are invalid because of the interactions uh, between software and hardware. Those becomes uh, infeasible or invalid. For that, we are proposing and we are exploring uh, ML-driven design space uh, or architecture explorations. Um, the other um, uh, challenge uh, in this space is that when you want to explore uh, the search uh, space and you want to um, kind of find the optimal design port or optimal accelerator configurations, you may need to evaluate uh, those parameters and those configurations um, uh, using cycle level simulators or uh, product grade uh, simulators. Those are very, very uh, costly uh, evaluation process and uh, uh, which basically um, makes the search um, much more challenging and uh, prohibitive 
to uh, run like an exhaustive search. For that, uh, we are uh, kind of trying to um, propose learned cost models and performance estimations, basically. So we're going to today, we're going to talk about each of these uh, kind of projects and uh, some of the uh, key analysis that we have done so far. So first, design space and architecture exploration. Um, so we are talking about black box optimization for automated design space and architecture exploration, basically. So um, uh, I would like to kind of divide the space into two uh, subparts. On, on the left side, we have the optimizers, which can be any algorithms, um, any black box algorithms. Uh, like, for example, you can think of it as uh, reinforcement learning and Gaussian processes, uh, evolutionary algorithms. And on the right side, we have the evaluators, uh, which basically um, are, uh, are on uh, simulators and uh, performance estimation tools and so on and so forth. The way that this space works and the way that kind of generally we uh, perform our optimization is that the optimizer starts by proposing some solutions to, um, uh, to the evaluators. At the beginning, probably those solutions are random. And uh, sends these uh, kind of solutions to the evaluator and tell, tells the evaluator to evaluate these solutions and send back the um, uh, evaluation results. Once this process is done, the optimizer updates its internal state and uh, propose a new set of solutions. Generally, this new set of solutions are much better and have higher quality compared to uh, the previous set of solutions. And we go back and forth between optimizer and evaluators. And as, the, uh, as it progresses, uh, the optimizer uh, provides better and better solutions until it converges to a uh, kind of a reasonable solution or um, a high performing solution. However, uh, this is a well-known um, technique and people have been uh, working on this for a while. But there are uh, two main challenges in this space uh, for um, accelerator uh, architecture exploration or design space exploration. One is, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide as well, um, these, are, um, these evaluations are generally expensive and timely to uh, kind of uh, evaluate uh, because we are dealing with uh, cycle level uh, simulators, uh, power measurements, and so on and so forth. So we want to reduce the number of evaluations that we perform for our, uh, for our exploration. On the other hand, um, so one of the uh, uh, other issues that we are dealing with in the um, accelerator space is that uh, the manifold is non-smooth and um, discontinuous. Basically what happens is um, um, we have, as I mentioned, we have a lot of infeasible solutions or invalid solutions uh, that we are dealing with and it creates a lot of discontinuity in our um, space. The other part is that we are dealing with a lot of cliffs and ups and downs and rapid up and, uh, up and downs. And the reason for that is uh, it's uh, because, uh, like for example, let me give you an example, is like once your um, kind of uh, on-chip memory is below a threshold, uh, we need to communicate with the um, off-chip DRAM and can, that can um, significantly increase your uh, latency or runtime. So those cliffs, cliffs are very uh, kind of normal uh, in this space. So today uh, I'm gonna talk about um, one of our uh, kind of target accelerators, which is HTPU. Um, and uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the techniques that we uh, studied for uh, designing, uh, kind of tuning the architecture parameters for this accelerator. Uh, to give you a little bit of uh, background about HTPUs, um, HTPU is a template-based architecture, which mainly uh, allows us to um, kind of tune 
the architecture parameters and um, kind of um, provide an end effort solution. In this ecosystem, you can change. Uh, it's highly parameterizable and it allows you to kind of uh, change the architecture parameters and evaluate your uh, solutions. Um, some of the uh, architecture parameters that we can change in this uh, uh, accelerators are processing engines and uh, processing engine memory, number of cores that we have, number of compute lanes and size of core memory, size of, uh, the bandwidth between off-chip and on-chip memory, and so on and so forth. Um, so in this slide, um, I wanted to kind of uh, show you an example of how a convolution uh, layer loop nest is uh, mapped to a uh, on on an H TPU uh, basically. So on the left side, uh, I'm showing a loop nest, a CNN loop nest, uh, without batching. And on the right side, uh, we can see the steps that we take to calculate the uh, kind of uh, output vector, which is here. So let's start here. So we have multiple MAC units, each of them in parallel. Uh, reads the uh, input, which is shared across all of them, and reads its corresponding weight, performs the um, computation, multiply, and then put the results into the output vector. As you can see, the shade, uh, the density of the shade is increasing. That shows that uh, we are dealing with partial sums and it is uh, kind of um, increasing. So in the second part, we read the second uh, element from the input vector. We read our uh, corresponding weights, perform the computation, and we move forward to the next step, and so on and so forth, until all the computation is done and the output vectors um, uh, kind of uh, output vector has all the values. So this was just to give you a sense how the computation is performed on HTPU. Okay, let's get to the uh, problem, uh, to, this, uh, to the search space for our design space exploration. Um, so um, I highlighted some of the parameters that are uh, very important in uh, kind of defining the latency and runtime of our uh, um, kind of um, uh, accelerator. So here you can see that we have a number of processing engines uh, which is 10 configurations, number of processing engines on the Y direction, uh, which is uh, 10 configurations, number of processing, uh, size of processing engine memory, size of core memory, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, I, will, I would uh, refer you to, uh, to the paper to see all the parameters. But uh, to give you a sense that how big is the search, the search space is, uh, the total combination is around 500 millions. So this is a huge search space, but remember, uh, we have a lot of infeasible points, and uh, uh, and also, uh, as I mentioned, we have a lot of cliffs. So it's a kind of sparse. We have only sparse points in this space. Um, so obviously, if we want to run some applications or models on this accelerator, and um, this is a set of um, kind of uh, models that we are working, uh, we kind of targeted. Uh, mobile Net V2, which many of you are familiar with, Mobile Net Edge, which again you are familiar with uh, from image classification domain. And some of the models that uh, is kind of um, um, uh, Google preferences, to Google uh, kind of mo internal models. And um, um, it belongs to the object detection space or semantic segmentation space. The number of layers uh, are here highlighted, the uh, size of parameters, number of MAC operations, number of convolutions, and uh, number of operations in different categories, and so on and so forth. Um, I just want to highlight here uh, two, uh, one point here, is that as you can see, uh, our models um, have different range of uh, basically um, uh, parameter size. So for example, model M4 and model M6, uh, they require less than one megabyte um, on-chip memory to load all the weights. 
another point that is actually very interesting is that, as you can see, um, comparing M4 and M6, the two models uh, which have uh, a small amount of uh, parameters, um, they have different computation. They have different computation requirements. Like M6 performs uh, around five or six times more computations compared to M4. So just to highlight, we have a diverse set of applications with different requirements. So if you remember in the um, kind of uh, the black box um, optimization slide, I mentioned that we have, we can put many different things for optimizer. So here um, I put a kind of a table which discuss all the algorithms that we have evaluated, evaluated, and one algorithm that is basically um, um, uh, the, the the our version of optimizer, and it is based on evolutionary algorithms and meta learning. So I'm going to talk about it more. Uh, I would refer you to our paper uh, to read more about this uh, these algorithms and all the kind of um, citations and everything is in the paper, so you can kind of refer to the uh, algorithms there. So we use model-based optimization, evolutionary algorithms, uh, Gaussian processes, uh, sorry, um, uh, yes, Gaussian processes and different uh, sort of uh, optimizers. So, but to remind you, our goal here is to find better design. So we want our accelerator to be more and more efficient, but at the same time, it is very important for us to find these designs, to find these optimal designs as fast as possible, because we we are we have the simulation cost, and it is very important for us to find the optimal point with as few samples or as few evaluations as possible. So those are the two goals that we are dealing with here. So fire, let's let's talk a little bit about our uh, kind of uh, algorithm. Firefly optimization. Firefly optimization is a well-known algorithm. It's a uh, kind of um, uh, it's a it's very it's well known in the community. Um, I'm gonna kind of in a very high level describe how this algorithm works. So basically, it is based on the fireflies. Um, so you start your um, population with some random uh, fireflies. Each firefly is associated with a density function. And the density function is uh, uh, correlated, uh, corre it's, correlate, it's, it's correlated with the objective function that you want to optimize. So let's say um, these are uh, kind of, uh, in, let's say the density function of each firefly uh, corresponds to, let's say runtime, because we want to optimize runtime. So if a firefly has a uh, higher density, it means it's, it's more promising. It has it attracts other fireflies to it. Um, so we are gonna kind of as uh, we are gonna associate or uh, kind of uh, associate the runtime. So the density, sorry, the um, kind of uh, dense uh, intensity, the light intensity of each firefly inversely proportional to the runtime means higher intensity, higher light intensity means lower runtime. So what happens? As I said, we randomly initialize our population. We calculate the objective function once. We associate it to the uh, in light intensity. And then based on the attractiveness of each solution, means higher light density, and the distance between these fireflies, there is also a uh, function that defines the distance. The lower the firefly with lower density, uh, lower light intensity, moves move toward uh, the ones with higher uh, light intensity. So basically, we are moving the uh, basically uh, not the, the the solutions that are not very good to the solution towards the solutions that are good that are uh, more promising. Once we have done that we're going to generate our next iteration, next generation, and we perform this in a loop until our solution converges. So one modification that we have done in this um, setting 
is uh, we added this meta learning part to it. So what is meta learning? For those of you uh, who may not be familiar with this uh, kind of process, meta learning is a branch of meta um, uh, cognition, which is concerned with learning about one's own learning and learning process. Basically, how we learn uh, things. So, um, so as I mentioned, like this optimizer also has not some uh, hyperparameters that we need to tune. Um, so as learn, like, like you can associate this like learning rate in your um, uh, machine learning uh, training or other parameters that we are dealing with uh, in, uh, in our optimizer. So if in a non-meta learning uh, approach, we may tune these hyperparameters, fix it, and then we perform our uh, optimization. But what we want to do is we want to dynamically adapt uh, or tune the optimizer's parameters uh, to basically make the solution or make the optimizer more um, adapted to the environment or to our search space so it can kind of uh, kind of uh, provide uh, higher, uh, provide better solutions. So what we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna actually add, use another high, uh, Firefly algorithm or optimization, which its job is not to perform the optimization on the search space, and rather its job is to perform uh, optimization and update the opti uh, optimization parameters or tune them uh, in regular intervals. So to give you the high uh, level overview is that the optimizer is working, the optimizer uh, co uh, collect the history of the rewards and send those to our meta optimizer, let's call it, or meta learner. The meta learner based on the history of the rewards is gonna suggest uh, new optimization parameters. And the optimizer uses those uh, updated parameters, adjusts the parameters, and continue the optimization. And this process moves forward and uh, uh, until we kind of uh, reach or converge to uh, our, our solution. There are more about this uh, algorithm in our paper, and I would encourage you to read uh, about this algorithm uh, there. So let's see uh, some of the parameters. So uh, we are dealing with multi-model optimization results, um, which basically means you have an accelerator and you want to tune the uh, accelerator parameters in a way that some collective uh, objective function across all the models is kind of optimized, uh, minimized or maximized. So here we define the, uh, this uh, objective uh, parameter uh, with geo mean of a speed up. A speed up over what? A speed up of over uh, our kind of uh, baseline accelerator, uh, which we use in uh, kind of Google. Um, and, uh, so, okay, so y-axis showing this uh, collective objective function, and x-axis shows the number of evaluations or number of steps that we took during the optimization process. Each solid line shows the uh, cumulative, um, basically, uh, objective value. So for example, here, like it shows that after 2000 steps, what is the best solution that we found so far? And the shaded area showing the, uh, showing the confidence interval. Um, as expected, uh, because our, our optimizers gets better, gets the optimizers get better, provide better and better solutions. That as we move forward, we are getting better and better results until we kind of uh, the optimizer converges. Um, okay, let me actually uh, highlight one more thing. Um, here we're also dealing with a, kind of a design constraint. We introduce a design constraint as well. So here we use the area budget as our one of the design constraints that uh, architects generally deal with. Here the area budget, we put uh, kind of, we explore these uh, optimizer in different scenarios, like area budget uh, 6.8 and area budget 5.8, which is tighter area budget. 
Remember, as we tighten the area budget, uh, the number of infeasible solutions is going to go up because now more solutions cannot be used, uh, cannot be material, materialized um, uh, as an accelerator. So, as you can see, um, um, in this um, kind of setting, uh, the Hyper Firefly finds solutions that which is a little bit better compared to other solutions. Uh, but here in this setting, as we tighten our search space, um, uh, it actually provide it actually finds uh, much better solutions. As you can see, the solid line is higher than the, the rest and um, basically performs better in this space. Um, having said that, okay, this solution is good, but remember, the convergence rate of this hyper firefly is slower compared to other algorithms. So you can see, for example, let's say um, evolutionary algorithm. It seems it finds the solution faster, but at some point, it cannot uh, provide uh, as good uh, solutions uh, as the Hyper Firefly algorithms. So that's uh, kind of a trade-off. If you have a tighter uh, budget uh, for number of evaluations, you might use other algorithms. But if you have a sufficiently large uh, uh, time budget, you may kind of leverage this Hyper Firefly algorithm. Uh, so let's uh, kind of study um, some of the architectural insight, or um, let me rephrase it this way. Let's explore what, what the optimization actually uh, find, what's, what's the optimizer finds in different uh, settings and how it changes the parameters uh, in different settings. So here uh, in this previous figure, we show you the collective speed up. Here we are showing the um, uh, per model speed up uh, in kind of different area setting. So this is very interesting. Do you remember we discussed the M4 and M6 and how uh, uh, kind of uh, the parameter size is much, much lower, uh, but their computation requirements uh, is higher basically. So here we saw that there is an interesting trend here that as we make the area budget tighter, basically uh, the optimizer, uh, because it cares about the collective uh, uh, um, kind of metric, the optimizer actually improves the speed up for M4 and improves the speed up for M6. M6. And let's see how it does it. So let's see uh, if there is any kind of insights here. Yes. What it does is actually, it says that because now I have a tighter area budget, it may make sense to sacrifice uh, on-chip memory, uh, like uh, cell memory, and add more to the compute. Because there are some models here that can benefit from higher compute. Yes, you can say that, oh, it's, uh, it uh, reduces the speed up for mobile net edge. You can see here is around 1.3 and here is actually below one. But that's okay because the, the speed up that we get for M4 is much, much larger than the decrease of uh, uh, speed up uh, that, uh, that we get in mobile net edge uh, TPU basically. So uh, it's very interesting that the optimizer can find these uh, kind of trade-offs and uh, optimize uh, the target accelerators. Um, so here we define two different metrics uh, and explore them across all the uh, optimization algorithms. One is the average feasibility ratio. So basically remember, we care about feasible solutions. The higher the feasible ratio, the better uh, it, we have higher chance to find better solutions. So we want this feasibility ratio uh, to be uh, actually 
um, low, basically. So we want them to be uh, low. We want to only explore feasible uh, regions. So as we can see, the hyper firefly and actually um, uh, Vizier performs reasonably good solutions. The interesting part is the max regard. So we explore, this is the average across all the uh, optimization algorithms. We explore what is the average best result across different optimization algorithms after different um, step interval. Like for example, after 1000 steps, what is the best solution? Uh, after 2000, what is the best solution? And so on and so forth. So you can see that, for example, after 1000, it's actually hyper firefly. It's, mm, the solution is not much better compared to MBO or even evolutionary. But as we increase our time budget, the uh, hyper firefly algorithm finds better and better solutions compared to other uh, optimizations. So that makes the Hyper Firefly a solution that actually performs well if you have a uh, relaxed time constraint. Um, so uh, one other metric that we care about is the diversity of the solutions. So here we are showing the TSNE across all the evaluation uh, optimization algorithms again, and um, across the uh, across the solutions that we found in uh, in each algorithms. So here you can see. Let me highlight two things. Uh, uh, and the the radius of each circle shows the reward function or objective value. So if this is small, it's not. A, if it is, if the radius is larger. It means it's a, it has a better reward solution and it's more promising. So here you can see that Hyper Firefly is actually explores uh, space is uh, in, in the explores the search space is in a more uniform way. And not only that, but also provide uh, finds a very a sol the solutions with very uh, with high reward. The radius is really large. Whereas, for example, Vizier solution it's it's also kind of diverse but remember uh, that it does not find uh, good solutions it's the radius is very small and other solution is basically some clustering they it seems like they stuck in one part of the space and they cannot explore uh, the uh, space very well and actually uh, our uh, quantitative metric which is the mean pairwise distance. So basically, between each two points, we calculate the uh, distance and we average um, in the whole, uh, across all the solutions. Um, so we can see that Hyper Firefly, the R algorithm, um, provides a more diverse uh, solution compared to other algorithms. Finally, we are showing the TSNE of the search space. Uh, one of the takeaway from this slide is that I want you to see that how many invisible solutions we are dealing with in this search space. In both, in here is the evolutionary algorithm and ensemble methods. You can see that the search space is very, uh, it has a lot of invisible solutions. But uh, looking at the results, uh, we can see that both solutions they are they're having some kind of clustering mechanism. So they find a good solution and they grow in that uh, space and kind of they stuck there. Whereas Hyper Firefly, our algorithm, is actually search one space, grow there, but it does not stuck there. It's kind of explore the search space in a more diverse way. So um, that's uh, one of the reasons that we believe that Hyper Firefly algorithm works better compared to uh, other uh, algorithms. Again, it really depends on your time budget as, as well, um, uh, time budget for your search as well. So if uh, you have a tighter um, um, time budget, Hyper Firefly may not be a good solution for, uh, for your uh, design. So I think 
with that, I want to kind of put an end uh, for the first part uh, and kind of uh, talk a little bit about a very open-ended solution, open-ended question and this research question that uh, I am interested to explore. So we talked about so far about the accelerator design and how we can tune uh, the accelerator parameters to find better, to find a more efficient accelerators, to design more efficient accelerators in a more automatic way. But I think the kind of the intuitive way to extend this work is to see how we can kind of uh, perform this um, uh, optimization across the stack, which basically cross stack uh, optimization. So right now, what we have thought about it is that, okay, we have the accelerator, we map the uh, kind of solution or application uh, using the compiler or code generation to that accelerator space. But remember, the compiler and the code generation phase also um, have a lot of parameters, a lot of uh, uh, different mappings and different um, um, kind of parameters for uh, uh, tuning. So it would be very interesting to um, optimize uh, both compiler and accelerator together, which uh, kind of uh, at the same time, which we call it cross-stack optimization. But um, it's very challenging. Uh, first of all, to um, search across the compiler parameters or the different mappings that you are dealing with. But that search space is huge as well. And there is no guarantee that you can find the best mapping for this particular architecture. So we are dealing with some non-determinism in uh, this uh, hierarchical or cross-stack cross -stack optimization. Having said that, we're moving toward the next the step, which is uh, ML-driven performance estimation models. Uh, let's open this part with a question. Why do we need generalized performance estimation? I think um, I briefly talked about it uh, at the beginning, uh, but let's review that. Um, first is hardware simulation is costly and very time consuming. So product level simulations, may take one to two hours to complete. It's uh, very time consuming and we cannot run all the different um, design kind of points in the search space for all of this possible uh, architecture uh, simulation, uh, architecture conflicts. One way say that, oh, okay, so why not using the analytical models? Um, first, analytical models are hard to maintain. If your architecture changes a little bit, if uh, some of the parameters, you introduce a new, uh, let's say, microarchitecture um, component, then you have to change your analytical model. You have to update your uh, analytical model. Uh, and they don't generalize to unseen configurations very well. Uh, and it requires uh, architecture expertise and someone who understands the architecture really, really well to come up with those analytical models. Aside from that, the analytical models are not as accurate as product level simulation. And um, this inaccuracy in the analytical model may uh, kind, of, um, uh, kind of misguide uh, the optimizer and find uh, and led to suboptimal solutions. For that, we want to introduce and propose a generalized learn model that generalizes to different applications and also different accelerator configuration. This is kind of two important things. Uh, we want to have a model that if we, uh, if we kind of add a new uh, kind of unseen application, it can generalize as well. And also um, uh, kind of, if we change the accelerator parameters, we want this solution uh, to kind of generalize uh, to uh, unseen accelerator configurations as well. Um, so basically this is our model 
fast, accurate, and generalized performance estimator, uh, which gets the architecture configurations and application embedding, and um, uh, uh, estimates the performance, which is latency, runtime, power, etc. Um, you might say that uh, okay. So actually, let's explain that in the next slide. So. As I mentioned, this is a very uh, challenging problem uh, to have a kind of a complete solution that generalizes both across architectures and also application. So we decided to start with uh, kind of finding or proposing a solution uh, for that generalizes across different applications. So this is kind of our first uh, target for uh, introducing performance estimator. So we want to have different application and estimate the latency or power and other performance metrics. So for that, we are trying, we kind of, uh, actually one of the challenges that I want to highlight is here. So the application, you can think of it as a kind of a, a DFG, like directed, uh, and uh, directed graph of operations and connectivity between them. So you perform the computation for one graph and send the result to another graph, to another node to perform the next computation. Um, so one intuitive direction. Uh, so basically we cannot pass the whole application to the model. It's discrete. It has, uh, it's, there's, uh, there's, it's it's not possible to pass the whole application to the model. So what we want when what we really care about is to design a kind of embedding and map our application into this embedding vector. It's one vector, continuous space, and pass that embedding to our model, to our performance model, to estimate the performance matrix. And as you actually saw it, the uh, um, intuitive way to do it is to use graph neural networks. Let me give you a quick uh, overview of graph neural networks. Um, so when we are saying about the graph neural network is uh, we assume that each node uh, uh, is associated with a vector. So you can see each vector is an associated vector. And let's say we want to find the embedding of these particular nodes. We want to understand the interactions between different nodes and different um, vector embedding and find how they impact this particular node. So this happens through a message passing uh, uh, tech, uh, approach. Each node sends its embedding to neighbors and we perform some computations and update the nodes embedding. So this is the first step. The second step, as I mentioned, the neighboring nodes to this node send messages, send their, their embedding. This node uh, aggregate these uh, embeddings and updates its, uh, its own embedding. You can see that the color is changing. Again, now we, we're gonna propagate this across all this, uh, 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 sorry, each node performs this computation for itself. Again, so until we do it multiple times, until we reach to a kind of a steady state. So our proposal is that we want to use graph neural network to learn the application embedding um, uh, basically as well. So, so as I mentioned, like each node represents an operation, let's say addition, multiplication, and so on and so forth. And the edges shows show the dependency between the operations. So each operation is associated with an embedding, same. And there is a message passing that is happening between different nodes. So you can see that um, each operation uh, sends its embedding to kind of a, because we want to learn the application embedding, sends send their embeddings to kind of a global node. We perform the aggreg uh, aggregation, 
and we calculate the application embedding. So that's something that we want to use for our problem setting as well. Um, okay, so uh, let's, uh, so for, for the application part, we are using a NASBench 101. So NASBench 101 uh, consists of uh, around 500 K models, CNN models. And we want to see, we want to see if it is possible to estimate the performance of these models um, for one particular architecture, uh, for one particular architecture, and see if it can generalize to unseen graphs, basically, unseen uh, CNNs. So here is an example of one cell of NASBench. So you can see that we have inputs, convolution operations, max pooling, and convolution operation again until you calculate the output. Uh, so let me tell you something here. Um, so I, I think in the paper you can find more uh, information about NASBench 101 and uh, how we kind of perform uh, the, how we can apply, how we apply kind of graph neural network uh, for this uh, problem. So. Here, I just wanted to highlight that how we deal with uh, the graph representation for uh, this model. So each edge, for each edge, we associate it to one because for us, all edges have uh, the same weight, the same representation. There is no difference, uh, difference uh, between them. Uh, for the nodes, operation nodes, we're gonna find a uh, kind of a unique embedding, as you can see, for example, in this example, we assign two, value two, vector two, for convolution three by three. So you see one, two, 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 and two. For example, for convolution one on one, we use four, and so on. For input, we use one, and for output, we use five. So this is the vector that we use to kind of perform the message passing and operation and so on and so forth. Um, so I, to, in the presentation, I'm not going to talk about the uh, model that we used. I think it would be great if you can uh, read the paper and see how the model works, basically. But the high-level idea is that we use message passing across different nodes to compute the embedding, basically. Uh, okay, here as well. Uh, so as I mentioned, so remember, right now we simplified the problem. So right now we, for each particular hardware configurations, we are gonna train one custom uh, model to predict the performance, basically. Uh, here I talked a little bit about uh, kind of NASPENCH 101. I think I can skip this slide and I think you can kind of uh, read more uh, about this in the paper. Okay. So we use three different configurations uh, for um, uh, for our kind of uh, problem. So uh, this these are different accelerators, different edge TPU accelerators in different classes of computation. So uh, all the information about the, the configurations uh, you can find it here. So. Um, I think this is a slide that is kind of not directly related to um, the kind of our performance model, but I just wanted to highlight that this is very interesting to see that how the, the model validation accuracy, this is kind of the CNN model accuracy, not the performance estimator. Uh, how the latency of different accelerators uh, varies in different region for example. So I just want to say that these are different accelerators uh, and they work differently. So for example, in a higher accuracy uh, regime, it seems V2, is v v2 the, uh, the accelerator V2 is the winner. It provides um, uh, basically lower latency. However, if we are to sacrifice the latency, uh, to sacrifice the uh, the accuracy of our model a little bit, it seems V1 is the winner. Uh, and we can kind of use V1 to provide uh, models with higher validation accuracy. 
and so on and so forth. So uh, as if you can kind of um, um, decrease, uh, sorry, sacrifice accuracy more and more, maybe uh, other accelerator configurations are more suited for that region. So that's highlighted that how the behavior of each accelerator um, uh, changes, sorry, how uh, the latency of each accelerator changes in different uh, regions. I think we can skip this. This is kind of just showing the different um, setting. Oh, just one thing that I want to kind of tell you is that uh, we actually collected the latency the, uh, from psych product level cycle accuracy simulator across all the NAS bench models, which is around uh, 1.5 million latency measurements. And we're going to kind of uh, public, uh, re publicly release these data sets so uh, other researchers can kind of build upon this data set and um, provide their models. So, how we uh, perform our training. So again, one particular architecture, different applications. So we are going to divide the uh, uh, CNN models, NAS bench models, into training and test uh, set. And our goal is to predict, to design a model which predicts the inference latency uh, for uh, different CNNs. Um, so, and the ground truth, as I mentioned, the ground truth for us is and the um, kind of the actual latency measurements that we uh, obtained by running uh, each model on uh, uh, kind of cycle accurate simulators. So that's our ground truth. So here uh, we can overview some of the results uh, across different hardware configuration. So for V1, um, so actually you can see also the learning rate, batch size, training set, and so on and so forth as well. Something that is worth to highlight is the uh, average accuracy of our performance model estimator, our graph neural network based um, model. And you see that we can kind of um, reach a very, very high accuracy. So this is the accuracy on a test set high accuracy across all the configurations. And it has a kind of high correlation between uh, the solutions that we get from our model and the ground truth, basically. So these are promising. Um, but still, remember, we haven't solved the next uh, uh, part, which is kind of how we can generalize across different accelerators. So that's also an ongoing uh, research effort uh, in our group. Uh, as we ended the previous part um, um, with an open-ended question or research direction, I would like to kind of end this part as, well, as an uh, open-ended question as well. So one of the challenges that we kind of, I think, um, I, I, I highlighted is that for training this model, we kind of collect a lot of uh, hardware measurements. And that's kind of costly, and um, it's not ideal that you collect a lot of hardware measurements. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's very time-consuming. Um, so ideally, we want to have a very high accurate. Uh, we want to have a model with a very very high accuracy in predicting performance. At the same time, we want to collect as few samples, uh, as few ground truth samples as possible. So we uh, performed an, a kind of uh, experiment. On y-axis, we basically changed the training size with 5% of the training size, 4% of training size, and we decreased that. Basically, we wanted to see at which point the uh, accuracy uh, is kind of drop. So as you can see, beyond 1.5 or so on and so forth, the accuracy is kind of reasonable. But below this threshold, the accuracy drops significantly. 
And that's kind of cover the research questions that we want to answer. This is the part, this is the region that is actually we are interested in. We want to see if it is possible to use some ML techniques to basically push this region, push the accuracy in this region higher and higher. We want to see if it is possible to uh, basically, with as few samples as possible, get higher accuracy, um, kind of comparable accuracy or on par accuracy to this region. So this is again uh, ongoing uh, effort in our group and it's a uh, very exciting um, and um, I hope we can get more people to work on uh, these uh, problems basically. With that, um, I think I end my talk. I just wanted to uh, kind of um, tell you about uh, the workshop that we have at ISCA 2021. Uh, actually the date has changed so I think uh, please check the website uh, to see the um, updated uh, dates uh, conference and workshop date. So this year, and I encourage you, please uh, encourage you to submit your works. It doesn't matter to be complete. Uh, work in progress is uh, encouraged and we would like to have a kind of engage the community more into these uh, areas. So this year for the first time, we actually uh, kind of added a different venue to our workshop, which is, we are very excited about it. And that's um, a kind of ML-based data prefetching competition. So um, this is very, very exciting. And it's uh, uh, the community is already very excited about it. It's basically, we are looking for novel solution, ML-driven and novel solution uh, for data prefetching. And um, more information, you can find it in the website. We have a Google Groups and uh, the, uh, the co-organizer are very responsive and uh, help you to uh, get on this problem and um, see uh, what you are uh, kind of proposing. We are very excited about that. So with that, I end my talk and thank you very much. Uh, I would like to kind of uh, thank uh, all the co-authors, all of my collaborators at Google, which uh, kind of enabled all these studies and all these research directions. Um, there is a long list of names. Uh, please refer to our papers. And uh, with that, I will end my talk. Thank you so much.